Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for kind invitation and introduction. Um, this is a very important clinical problem and still the matter of debate over the optimal therapy. All three options are attractive and still are being compared. I have a privilege to talk about uh, carotid stenting and I'll try to convince you that this is the better option than carotid endarterectomy. At least, and I would say for sure, for a certain group of patients. Um, when, um, when we talk about carotid stenting and carotid endarterectomy, we have to realize that those two are uh, quite different uh, procedures. Um, carotid and, uh, carotid uh, endarterectomy is the plaque removal. We uh, clamp the artery on the, si on the north and the south pole, and then we scrapped off uh, atherosclerotic lesions. We have ideal protection from thrombotic complications within the, let's say, 30 minutes of total clamping time. And then we put the uh, flow together nowadays, um, almost always with patching, and we restore blood flow um, to the vessel. Um, the stenting, on the other hand, is plaque trapping. We trap uh, the plaque with the stent and then wait until it will be endothelialized. We use um, thromboembolic protections because at this time there is a relatively high risk of embolic complications. And, and this is probably a good occasion to remind you that uh, stroke and, and a patient with carotid disease is mainly related to, to embolization. About le probably less than about 5% of cases will be related to total occlusion of carotid artery. Yet, um, it is important to realize um, that thrombotic complications, um, in summary, are quite different uh, in terms of how they developed comparing endarterectomy and stenting. For carotid endarterectomy, um, the claim time is about 30 minutes, and then post uh, surgical immediate post-operative thrombosis represent the risk of um, stroke. Um, then the next complication is myocardial infarction. We have to realize that this is a very disease or morbid group. Um, endarterectomy is associated with the risk of cranial nerve injury and difficulty with wound healing. On the other hand, stenting can cause stroke because of periprocedural embolus. And also, we might expect to have complications with the access. This is uh, just an example of a quite nice looking um, uh, terrible lesion. And then we have a very nice result with post-stent uh, uh, restoration of decent flow. However, we might have a situation like that when we have quite a lot of atherosclerosis within the aortic arch. And moving with the catheter to do um, and endovascular treatment can create a lot of embolic complications even at this level. The other lesion points out to the area that we would try to go through the uh, embolic protection device might generate or induce embolic complication at this level. So anytime we look at the lesion, we might assess whether it is a local high-risk patient or it is a general risk patient. And we look also at the um, imaging studies to decide which option might be associated with the lower risk. In general, we assess this risk by looking at um, three aspects, or two in a sense. One is the symptomatology, and the other one is severity of stenosis. Patients who are symptomatic have a much higher risk of another stroke, particularly within the next six months, and all, and majority, uh, well, um, at least some of um, meta-analysis show that for symptomatic patients, the crucial time to do surgery is first two weeks after the first episode. Um, versus asymptomatic when the risk of um, stroke is significantly lower. I also wanted to point out the definition of symptoms, and I know that in a lot of situations, we don't follow those uh, recommendations, so it's worth to, um, to underline, first of all, it needs to be 
either ipsilateral amaurosis fulgex or contralateral motoral sensory findings or aphasia. So for example, dizziness or uh, syncopal or presyncopal episodes are not symptoms of carotid disease. And we know that a lot of patients are treated because they are declared as symptomatic. Moreover, after six, I mean, if it's more than six months since the last symptom, it is, by this definition, asymptomatic patients because risk of recurrence in this patient is essentially pretty much the same as asymptomatic. Severity plays a role, and I'm just giving you an example of prior studies that we would not talk too much about because it does not refer directly to anthorectomy. So in other words, um, symptomatic patients from those big trials from early 90s, and it clearly showed the linear relationship between severity of stenosis and the risk of um, a stroke without uh, uh, surgical treatment. It also pointed out enormous benefit of surgery over uh, medical therapy from those days. Uh, you can hardly ever find nowadays such a, a, a superb result that, which says that you need to treat six patients to prevent one stroke. Current trials are showing benefit of uh, uh, that you need to treat 100 patients, 200 patients to avoid uh, outcome. And here, it's just unbelievable. Um, we can divide the clinical situation into high surgical risk uh, situation and no surgical risk situation. And it makes a big difference in terms of what treatment option you choose. So let me summarize very quickly surgical high risk features because um, all our colleagues, Dr. McBain and Shuba, will talk about this thing too. So in general, it's more very intuitive, and, and most uh, colleagues, surgical colleagues, will deal with this thing on a regular basis. So we have a local unfavorable anatomy, either because of previous um, surgery and restenosis, or more even so or importantly prior radiation therapy you might have a very high or very low uh, lesion that it's not easily suitable for surgical approach you have a contralateral occlusion or an, a difficulty with neck flex, uh, flexion um, presence of tracheostomy and the presence of already laryngeal nerve palsy uh, and in general are, again, very, um, very obvious um, an elderly patient with um, unstable angina or very high um, a level of congestive heart failure symptomatology, <laughs> patients uh, with, uh, that would require surgeon, uh, uh, urgent cardiac surgery, a patient on dialysis and severe pulmonary situation. That, and we will talk, therefore, about the clinical trial that set up um, the role of carotid stenting in the, era, um, in the field of carotid artery disease. And it was a sapphire trial that compared high-risk patients um, to um, be treated either with stent or surgery. And so the um, committee of uh, this study will decide whether or not patient could be randomized. So in other words, if the patient would not be a reasonable candidate for either surgery or stenting, he will go to the registry instead, either to the registry for stenting or registry for surgery. And then I pointed out in yellow that patients who were decided by vascular surgeons that they would do better with stenting, not with surgery, was more than those who were eligible for randomization. See, 334 patients went for randomization, but 406 for surgery, uh, for, sorry, for endo endovascular treatment. Only seven were decided that they will do better with, uh, with surgery, even before randomization. Um, the uh, uh, stent um, versus surgery was for patients who had um, uh, symptoms and more than 50% stenosis for asymptomatic, 80% stenosis, as I mentioned, it was uh, a study that was designed for non-inferiority. 
The uh, results um, um, showed um, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, the number is relatively low compared to the subsequent study we'll be talking about. So although you see an, in row numbers um, a def difference, it did not reach statistical significance for superiority. So indeed, it showed non-inferiority of uh, endovascular treatment, both for global death stroke MI at 30 days and then the same composite outcome uh, a year later. There were some criticism of the study. Um, mainly, there was a slow enrollment I mentioned, and pe more patients were in registry than in randomization. It was insufficient power to analyze superiority, as I mentioned, too. Um, I'm not going to talk about a lot of other trials for sort of obvious reasons. So one, that there was no e general use of embolus uh, protection devices that um, that a lot of uh, standards, people who do endovascular treatment are very unexperienced. And one study showed that only uh, slightly over 11% of uh, interventional radiologists or those who did carotid and uh, um, stenting did more than 12 procedures per year. And there were some financial issues. Those studies were stopped prematurely. ICSS, probably the biggest trial, uh, 1700, had only a uh, protection device as, as a suggestion or not a requirement for intervention. Therefore, the one, we have one really spectacular trial, which is CREST, and I'll concentrate uh, my discussion on this trial. It is a prospective multicenter and randomized control trial with blinded endpoint adjudication, which is a novelty compared to prior studies. And uh, more importantly, all participants, all participants of this trial had to go through the very careful scrutiny, surgeons and interventionalists. And I think that Dr. McBain will talk about this thing a little bit more, but again, it's a very important issue. There were quite a lot of patients, well over a thousand in each arm, and uh, a decision uh, regarding um, outcomes and then the clinical trial performance was b all based on the team. It's like, you know, we have this cardiology team or myocardium uh, team, and here it was a, a stroke team. It included interventionalists, vascular surgeons, uh, research coordinator, neurologists. Um, major eligibility criteria seems quite obvious and, and, and um, reasonable for patients who are symptomatic, either more than 50% by angiography and more by 70 by ultrasound. It were some discrepancy than CT, MRA, and it needs to show uh, stenosis over 70%. For asymptomatic patients, a little bit higher criteria with angiography showing more than 60% stenosis, ultrasound 70, but if there were any doubt or discrepancy, then the CT and MRI needs to show more than 80% stenosis. Uh, I also point, what, want to point out the clinical outcome that was re endpoints that were really uh, reasonable to me. First, they wanted to assess the periprocedural uh, uh, complications and compose it of any stroke, myocardial infarction or death, and then follow them for four years to find out if they developed any other stroke on the, on the site that the patient was treated. Um, as you can see, the primary endpoint per procedural show no difference uh, between carotid stenting and surgery. And if you divide this thing, if you break it down to more detailed information, it would show that patients who are treated with with uh, stenting had a higher rate of stroke, but lower rate of myocardial infarction compared to surgical group. And um, I would point out, because Dr. McBain will be talking about the impact of stroke versus myocardial infarction, which seems to be favored surgical treatment. I wanna point it out that although the total stroke was higher for endovascular, sorry, for endovascular treatment, but major stroke, the stroke that left patient with significant disability was not significantly different in both arms. 
Uh, other things were sort of obvious. Um, also, there was no um, higher rate of stroke uh, four years later or up to four years follow-up, indicating that all the non-major strokes that contributed to superiority of, of surgery over endovascular treatment were related to the procedure itself and can be minimized with better em 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 embolic, em embolic protection because in a subsequent follow-up period there was no difference in the, in the stroke rate. There were obvious uh, complications related to surgery, including cranial nerve palsy. This 0.3% comes from cross, uh, crossing. Those patients were still treated with surgery, even though they were within the endovascular arm. Uh, I want to also point it out with the nowadays new register and new um, uh, embolic protection devices, we might have a much better protection from stroke. This is just one of the example of armor registry that showed zero periprocedural stroke in symptomatic patients who were treated with angioplasty and stenting. Therefore, we have this general recommendations by multiple um, American societies and they have class one indications saying that if patient is low or average surgical risk and, and who experience uh, symptoms uh, within the last six months, he should, in other words, this is class one, should undergo carotid endarterectomy for ipsilateral stenosis that is higher than 70%. And they give a level of evidence A for um, angiographic lesions of higher than 50%, they give an evidence of, a level evidence of B. Um, however, the team who would do it needs to have a rate of periprocedural stroke or mortality complication of less than 6%. So if you don't know your own periprocedural risk, don't follow those recommendations. It also points out that and our uh, stenting is a reasonable alternative for surgical treatment for symptomatic patients, but it gives the evidence of B. Um, why, one would ask, if the, the CREST trials show that they are equivalent. And I can tell you from the American experience that it's mainly because our Medicare and Medicaid would not reimburse endovascular treatment unless patient is high surgical risk. Uh, so therefore, you have now indications for asymptomatic patients, which are two level, which means that it's reasonable to do. It, shouldn't, it doesn't say that you should do it. It's reasonable to do for asymptomatic if the lesion is more than 70%. And um, evidence A, and it's all saying that it's also reasonable to choose surgery over um, stenting if for elderly patients, because the CREST trial showed that elderly patients will benefit more from surgery than from endovascular treatment, and younger patients will do better with endovascular. I would like to discuss this thing with Dr. McBain and with you, if you wish, for our 50 minutes uh, discussion time, but I'm just gonna go through it quickly and say that they also seems to give the same level of evidence B for uh, to choose stenting over surgery for the patient um, with a high uh, risk of neck uh, um, compli neck related uh, uh, complications and then the class B which um, seems to um, say that it could be in other words the lower rate of evidence that it could be reasonable to do a surgery sorry, to do endovascular treatment for asymptomatic patients who have stenosis of 60%, not higher than 60%, or 70% by ultrasound, but they point out that we really don't know what is the benefit because we don't know the current medical treatment outcome. That's all, that's all my presentation. I would like to invite you to discussion